three times a year, the Word of God commanded the Jewish people to make pilgrimage to Jerusalem. They were asked to come up to Zion for the Feast of Passover. They were asked to make pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. But then they were also asked to come up in autumn for the Feast of Tabernacles. It was the greatest of the three feasts in Israel. It was called in some of the biblical passages even just as the feast. They came to Jerusalem for the feast. And it was the most important feast because it was connected in Jewish tradition always with the messianic expectation. But there was something very special about the Feast of Tabernacles. It was different to the two other feasts because the Feast of Passover commemorating the Exodus from Egypt and the Feast of Pentecost, which was commemorating the day when God came down from, from heaven in fire on Mount Sinai and would give the commandments to the Jewish people, they could celebrate those two feasts already in the 40 years when Israel was wandering in the desert. They could commemorate back when they were released out of Egypt. They could commemorate how God spoke to them with an audible voice and they received the Torah from heaven. But it was different with the Feast of Tabernacles. The reason why this feast was so different to the other two feasts is actually laying right in the meaning of this tabernacle behind us. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles for the following reason. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So the reason why Israel couldn't celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles during the time of the desert wandering was simply because they still were in the desert. They were still living in tents, they were still living in tabernacles, they were forced to move their camp from one place to the next and they were exposed to the extremities of the desert life. Paul is referring to that in a wonderful way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and he's saying the following. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven, if indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. What Paul is telling us here in his epistle to the church in Corinthians, he said that our earthly life is actually a life like in a tent structure, like in a tabernacle, like in the 40 years of desert wandering of the Jewish people. That means we haven't arrived in the promised land yet. And he also concedes, he says, in this tent structure, in our earthly body, he says, in this body we at times even groan. That means sometimes we go through times of affliction, we go through times when our body is being tempted or even being struck by diseases. And he says even our spiritual walk sometimes with God can be challenging. He's expounding on that even in a greater manner in the chapter before where he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, but we have this treasure in earthly vessels that the excellence of the power may be with God and not with us. He says we are hard pressed on every side yet not crushed. He says, we are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. He says, sometimes in our earthly life, we will go through difficult times. But he says, you know what? God is with us. He will make sure that we will make it to the end. And he will make sure that our journey will indeed end in the promised land. So Paul was referring to the resurrection of the dead. He says, like Jesus was raised from the dead and received a resurrection body, he says, so you also will receive one day a glorified body, which is not no need of medical assistance, where you will not groan anymore, but the glory of God will actually be your dress and your clothes. But the Word of God is referring not only to our physical bodies as a tent structure, but he is also referring to something even more glorious. Join me reading the book of Hebrews chapter 11. 
By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Isn't it amazing that Abraham, even as he arrived here in the land of Israel, he made a very purposeful decision not to build a house for himself, a stone structure, but he rather preferred to live in a tent structure together with his sons Jacob and Isaac. And the Word of God tells us that there was a very significant purpose behind that, that Abraham understood that there was a city waiting for him, a city which would outdo every structure here on earth. He says it would be a city whose architect and whose builder would be God himself. And this was the city he was waiting here for even here in the land of Canaan. I want to encourage you here during this Feast of Tabernacles that even if you go today through a season of storm, if you go through a time which is difficult for your earthly body, for your earthly tent structure, God is with you. Paul says we have the presence of God in our earthly vessels and this is a regenerating power which is renewing us from day to day. At the same time, the Feast of Tabernacles, it gives us incredible hope for the future. It says one day God will come and he will regenerate and renew our earthly bodies with an incredible resurrection body. We will be like Christ, the Bible tells us. And at the same time, the Word of God also teaches us that there will come a city, a dwelling place for all the believers, the heavenly Jerusalem. He says it will be a city whose builder and architect God himself is. This is our glorious future which the Feast of Tabernacles is speaking about. And I wish you with this encouragement, God's blessing from the city of Jerusalem. May the Lord bless you richly out of Zion. In 1980, the Israeli parliament passed a law declaring a united Jerusalem as the eternal capital of the State of Israel. Threatened by the Arab League with an oil embargo, national embassies in Jerusalem closed their doors. That same year, Christians from around the world gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Sensing the isolation of the Israeli people, the participants and leaders of this gathering decided to establish the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem. The International Christian Embassy Jerusalem is since more than 30 years right here in Jerusalem to connect the global church with the nation of Israel. For many Jewish people throughout the centuries, the only face of Christianity, what they experienced, was the ugly face of anti-Semitism, of Christians persecuting the Jewish people wherever they found them. As Christian Embassy, we are here in Israel to show a new face of the church, a new face of Jesus Christ to the Jewish people. The mission of the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem is fourfold to educate the global church about Israel through events, television programs and print publications, to promote Christian celebration in Israel and around the world through the annual Feast of Tabernacles celebration, to mobilize the worldwide body of Christ in prayer for Israel, influencing global leaders and ICEJ representatives in over 80 nations and to show compassion to the people of Israel through social projects that are changing lives in every sector of Israeli society. To learn more about the ICEJ and how you can partner with us, visit ICEJ.org. You are the director of our creative and musical department here in Jerusalem with the Christian Embassy. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Yuha. It's good to be here. Ray, you've been living in Jerusalem for how many years now? Seven? Mm -hmm. 2007, we came to Jerusalem to serve with the Christian Embassy. and. We're, we're here now uh, seven years later and two kids. And seven is a number, you know, it's a perfect number. 
It is uh, a godly number. Uh, yes, a godly <laughs> number. Uh, now, Ray, seriously speaking, you've been uh, a part of the Christian Feast of Tabernacles for many, many years here in Jerusalem. We put it up, uh, organize it every year. Mm -hmm. And you also know how the Jewish people are celebrating it, uh, but also uh, with the Gentile nations coming in. Now, Ray, what do you think? What is the significance of the Gentile nations coming every year to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles with us? Well, you are. Recently, I've just in my own study time, I've been going back through the Old Testament, reading in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And as I was reading the commandments for the feasts of the Lord that, that God gave to the, the people of Israel at that time, um, at least for me as a, as a Christian, as I, you read a lot of the, the commandments in the Old Testament, you, you can get a sense that, that God is being very like, you shall do this, and it's very, very harsh. But as I begin to read and I begin to look and then look at it in contrast to uh, the prophecies given such as, as in Zechariah um, concerning the feast and also looking at the character of, of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, Jesus was, uh, is, is, was God made flesh. He was God on the earth. So he, he, he gave the character of God in, in a human form and he, he displayed the character of God. And in Jesus, we see compassion and love and, and the desire to fellowship with people. You see him spending time with uh, tax collectors and, and people that probably would have been considered outcasts, but he loved that opportunity to fellowship. And I think part of that is, is God desires fellowship. And so I think there's a part of the commandment in the feast that God just wasn't giving them a day that they had to do something, but God really desired these celebrations, desired that the people would come together, that he could tabernacle and, and fellowship with them in these times. And so I think um, then when you look at Zechariah and, and you see it speaks about the nations Coming yeah, Gentile nation. And in, in a time, that prophecy is, is given in the millennial time when, when Jesus is on this earth reigning from this city. Um, why, the question came to my mind, why would God continue this mm -hmm. through the millennial period if it really wasn't something that he desired, if it wasn't a desire that was on his heart that the nations would come to Jerusalem to worship and to seek him? Um, if he didn't desire that, why would he continue this through that period? And so I think the nations coming to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, I think touches at the very heart of God in, in a way that he desires people, not just the Jewish people, but even the nations to come into to fellowship with him at this time. And I think that's a, it, it just caught me in a way that I had never really thought about before, that this is something that truly God desires. Yeah, it's very interesting, Ray. Like you're talking about the Zechariah 14 when it says, if I may read it, it says, and it shall come to pass, and then it continues to saying that, that uh, all the nations shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So, like you said, it's very interesting that God actually gathers to Himself. It's, it's a desire in Him for, for, from all the nations, people, almost it looks to me like He wants to gather them under His wings yeah. for the glory. And also, I think, in a time of celebration in a way, you know, this, as you know, this feast is a feast of joy and celebration. Mm -hmm. You've just come through, uh, for, for the biblical perspective, for the Jewish people, they've just come through uh, two festivals that are very um, inward thinking, that, you know, they're looking at their hearts, they're looking at repentance, uh, and then it comes to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and then it releases out to this festival of joy and celebration. And, you know, isn't that that God would gather people from the nations to come and be joyous and, and celebrate with him. What, what, you know, what an amazing thing to yeah, see. Yeah, it's actually an expression of the character of God for the glory of the Lord to flow. And like you said, it's, uh, it's really uh, a joyous uh, festival. And we as Christians believing in Jesus, when we gather the people together to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles here in Jerusalem with us, it's a, it's a real joy. And I'd like you to explain a little bit about the worship that's going on, what type of worship, what, what we do every year. But I just uh, want to read that because God commands, like you said, it's actually a commandment mm. to rejoice. Mm. Regardless of your circumstances, mm. you shall rejoice in your feast. Your, you, your son, your daughter, your male servant, female servant, and the Levite, the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow. Mm. 
in other words, regardless of your circumstance, maybe somebody just lost their father or their spouse or whatever, or, you know, orphans, or, you know, rejoice. Yes. And this is a very, very joyful uh, festival. Please explain, you're the musical director of the Fees, you're leading us to worship. And yeah, and that we, as you know, we, we have an international team of, of singers and musicians that join us year after year. It's different people from, uh, from year to year, but uh, our desire is again to, to have a celebration of joy um, where we celebrate as, as a unified body of believers here in the city, but then also to have uh, times of, of worship where we can really pour our hearts out before God and, and be um, thankful and express our worship and our love to Him during this season. And I, I think uh, we do that through many things. We do it through song. Um, there's also visual elements. There's dance and other elements. And so we, we try and cover all of the creative arts in how we present our our worship and in, in our present our presentation what we do during the feast of tabernacles and again it's 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 uh, being fulfilled by people from many different nations so it's a unique experience um, i can't say that i've experienced anything like this um, in any other place other than here in Jerusalem where you see so many different people from nations coming regardless of their background you know um, we have people from even different uh, faith backgrounds in, in Christianity but they come here and all of that is just kind of set aside in, in the the desire just to come and, and to celebrate and to worship the Lord and it's a beautiful thing yeah it's a, it's it's with the nations it, it has this Israeli flavor and everything mm -hmm. and like you said, the, the worship expresses the, the content of the song, you know, in movements, it's, it's dancing, it's flags, it's costumes. And Ray, it's very creative. How, how do you do that? It changes every year, the platform and the expression and the, the worship. Where do you get it? Who gets it? Well, you know, I, I must say uh, I have a wonderful team of people that work with me year after year that are very creative, very gifted people, and they bring a lot of ideas to the table. Um, and obviously we, we typically have a theme for the feast mm -hmm. um, that, that we, we correlate to. And so the, the teaching comes, but then also we, we'll touch that theme through what we do in our, in our presentation, through the music, um, through the visual arts that you see from the... Uh, video projection systems to the dance and, and these types of things and um, I, again I, I have to say God obviously is the, is the inspiration I think for all of us creatively he gives us inspiration he gives us ideas but it's a, it really is a team effort I have um, probably about eight different leaders from different areas of, of, of the creative side that we work together we discuss what we're going to do and then they all work out their elements uh, and then it comes together in what you see um, at, at the Feast of Tabernacles on the platform. You know, many people from different nations, like we have every year from 70 to 80 different nations, thousands of Christians coming flooding into Jerusalem. By the way, as you know, it's the largest single tourist event every year in Israel. Yes. But uh, many of the people, they keep on saying that it's like a, a foretaste of heaven. Mm. You know, that the, every language, every tribe, and then the, this Israeli flavor coming out of it. It's, yeah. It's, it's gorgeous. It is. It, it is. Again, uh, for me, I'm, I'm amazed every year. And, I, you know, I'm involved in the creative part of it. But, but to be there and to experience, you remember um, in, over the last couple of years, we've had times when we, we'll finish a song. Um, and then there's just a moment where it just you'll just sense a hanging and then all of a sudden th the thousands of people in the congregation will just begin to spontaneously sing back out um, and it, it's just an amazing feeling to yeah, again to just feel people presence, in unity. Yeah, yeah. The presence of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. upon us, with us, through us. I mean no wonder they say that it, like I say it's, it's the fortress of heaven. Uh, and the Lord willing, we will continue. You know, this year the theme will be the Reformation. Reformation, exactly. Another very rich theme that I know Jürgen and, and we are already seeing now that God is, has his fingerprint on this idea of this theme and what's happening. And I know that will be talked about more in the coming year. But uh, really, honestly, you, all, you know, we pray as a staff and regularly for the feast and we fast and pray. pray exactly we fast and pray for the feast and and i know it's on our heart here as this ministry that ultimately god is glorified through this gathering um that 
that uh, what we do brings honor and glory to Him, and, and in a way that in, on many levels, that what takes place is a testimony to this nation. Yes, and that's very important. That, that what they see and what they may experience when they join us on Israeli night or if they come to you know, other, other events that take place around this time, that they, they see a testimony of God's faithfulness in that their, their, their Bible that says this is what's going to happen, they see it beginning to happen even in our day and age. Um, Ray, I'm, I'm always reminded about the very first feast more than 30 years ago. You know, the, the, the leaders, they went to see a rabbi. Right. asking how how do you celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles yes. and after he explained to them and they were about to leave from his office and they were about to go out he suddenly stops and says please wait and then he says that this must be the times of Messiah because you as Gentiles you know that the, the times of Messiah are approaching because you as uh, as Christians from the Gentile nations are celebrating this feast so it is actually a really strong platform it is. to speak with one voice from the nations to the lives of Israelis, the modern day Israelis. Yes. Uh, Ray, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and insights to the, to the great Feast of Tabernacles here in Jerusalem. Thank you, Yoha, my pleasure. And again, we look forward to seeing as many people every year that can join us for the feast. Uh, they're welcome to come and be with us. here in Haifa at the International Christian Embassy's home for Holocaust survivors. And let me tell you, this house here in Haifa is one of the most exciting projects which the Christian Embassy has undertaken over the past couple of years. The ICEJ's home for Holocaust survivors consists of nine buildings in one Haifa neighborhood. This small community serves as a haven of love and security for more than 70 elderly Israelis who survived the Nazi campaign of genocide. Thanks to the consistent giving of Christians just like you, we are able to provide these precious survivors with everything they need from day to day in one central location. This home is a unique home in all over Israel because there are no other homes just for Holocaust survivors. And there are no other homes that people can live here also without money or with small money that they give. And when they come here, they get everything they need. <laughs> אני חושב שהדבר הזה 
During the 65 years of the existence of the State of Israel, this is the best thing that Christians and Jews have done together. It's wonderful. It's all about this mutual giving and serving, Christians and Jews together. The media loves this. They appreciate the social solidarity that the Christians express towards the Jewish people, and of course, towards Holocaust survivors, who right now are in the last decades of their lives. So we need to appreciate them now. outside to eat in the restaurants, we go to the sea, we go, we have made, we go to the theater, yes, lectures from the outside. When uh, the, food, the food is still good, it's all, ex it is all excellent. <laughs> Here I have friends and I feel feeling here good. I, I am happy here. No? <laughs> We invite you to partner with us in this important work in Haifa by making a donation today. Your donation will assist us with providing for the day-to-day -day operational costs at the home. Roughly $1,250 per month per person is what it costs to provide for the basic needs of the residents. Your giving will make a significant difference in the lives of these beautiful people. So please consider how you can financially support us in this important project. You need to know that the vision of the International Christian Embassy in Israel is to show another face of Jesus and of the church to the Jewish people. And this is exactly what our home in Haifa is accomplishing. And I want to invite you again to partner with us. We are your outstretched arms and your feet here in the land. We are your embassy here in Jerusalem. May the Lord bless you richly out of Zion.